Hello everyone, welcome to another session. Today's topic is the operations in the marine environment. So uh, at this uh, presentation, we'll actually discuss on how we operate in a marine and harsh environment and what are the um, uh, problems we could actually face what the factors could affect to us and how we can actually um, uh, mitigate the problem like I mean how actually we can what types of uh, safety protocols and safety gears we will actually follow to uh, to um, to uh, combat the harsh environment okay so um, First of all, uh, the harsh environment so means, uh, well, what is the definition of the harsh environment could be? It could be like, I mean, um, uh, a very hazardous uh, types of uh, environment that a human being could not uh, withstand to it. For instance, if the, uh, if the temperature is too cold it's, uh, or the bitter, or if uh, at the marine environment, if there is a storm and there's a high um, tides and the shakings and if any emergency comes up to abandon the ship or the vessel, so how we can actually do the preparedness, so uh, this is the thing. Now, uh, working in a marine environment is really challenging if you see this uh, if you uh, see this picture, then you can actually uh, see it. I mean, the very similar cases actually happen in many times. Please watch these videos. You would have more understanding, like, I mean, how actually uh, this uh, marine uh, environment, how harsh it could be, okay? Now, um, what types of issues or what types of problems uh, we can actually uh, have uh, like the, here it's a chart uh, the chart about like the human performance uh, effect in, in the general environments okay uh, like in harsh environment what types of uh, issues uh, we could have what are the factors that affect our uh, human performance for instance like the coldness okay if it's really really cold uh, environment uh, especially in the offshore environment, uh, if it's really cold, then what we what issues we could have? We could have the breathing difficulties, the impacts. Okay, the uh, muscle stiffness uh, can have the frostbite, the lowered metabolism, the hypothermia. Okay, hypothermia is a is a uh, uh, is a phenomenon when um, human body temperature actually goes really low and it could lead to even death. Uh, we got to wear the bulky clothing and we can have the limited uh, mobility because of the bulky clothing, right? Uh, we can have the stiffness of the suit and impairing movement as, as I uh, say for the bulky clothing. Uh, the slippery surface, okay, uh, lots of us uh, uh, could actually um, slip in the ice, right? I mean, uh, this is a very, very common uh, accident at the winter time and definitely uh, add weight or mass, gain weight or mass in the, in the coldness due to the stiffness and also due to the um, lifestyle. Now, there could be a combined weather effect, for instance, like the snow, wind, and waves of the water, just exactly like that. It could be, there could be a combined uh, effect of all these all together, okay? And uh, low visibility, like uh, ice, fog, lack of uh, solar illumination, the frost in the window or the visor. So these, these will actually hinder the visibility of a person. So this could be the other impacts, okay? Remoteness, these are very, um, uh, not, not only like these uh, physical problems or physical impacts we would have, we have, we could have uh, 
uh, like a psychological impact and that is due to the remoteness, the fear of unknown, okay, and stress for being detached from the family for a long time. So these could also actually create like the stress, uh, this could increase the stress level too, okay. So these are the stressors and these are the impacts uh, so that we could have in uh, in a harsh environment okay now um, different types of hazards could increase risk for instance the collision uh, between the vessels iceberg and vessels uh, vessels and aquatic life so this could increase the risk of uh, this type of uh, incidents the remote location as you know um, it is a problem now how can we actually go to the remote location for instance the offshore platform how can we go in there uh, mostly uh, the most uh, common mode of uh, going there is that by helicopter okay or uh, like the transportation by boat uh, now transporting by the helicopter is also very challenging uh, i mean it starts with challenging because uh, you are actually landing to the harsh environment and uh, riding to the helicopter the harsh environment is very very weird. for instance if I actually give you um, the example like a Cougar Air Travel Crash in Newfoundland then you can actually find like the news this helicopter flight actually uh it crashed to uh go to this uh, the destination was Seedon's fpso okay and uh in march 2009 uh due to the uh, um, air was malfunction and landing to the collision with the water um there was a total uh, 16 passenger and uh, two crew total fatality was 17 that means total seven people died and there is only one survivor uh, who was also injured okay so this is one of the example but there are a couple of other examples actually happened in offshore uh, Newfoundland area only and not only here there are lots of other incidents actually happen so uh, today's uh, lecture will actually learn uh, what are the safety measures we would actually take to uh, prevent this kind of losses of life okay so the things now the most important part uh, of the safety uh, would be the due diligence which is very important due diligence is a level of judgment a care the prudence or the determination and activity that a person could reasonably to be expected to do under a particular circumstances okay uh, but the problem uh, in a remote and harsh environment that our due diligence sometimes actually hinder for instance these are like the impact you remember like the human performance affecting to the human performance with these types of uh, uh, stressors so um, like your employer owes a level of our due diligence to you in uh, providing a safe work environment but sometimes uh, exposing to the harsh environment without uh, having a certain I mean um, training or a lack of preparation that could cost life and that would be a big issue uh, for your company and also definitely for your families too so this is exactly why we need to know the safety measures in the um, uh, in the um, harsh environments okay so the first thing uh, we usually do before you leave to the uh, offshore we need to uh, have a minimum physical fitness okay and there uh, the blood urine uh, eyesight breathing different types of tests actually we have it's not only for the uh, for the offshore platform if you are interested in like I mean um, 
and like the other things like I mean uh, for instance uh, aircraft pilots they always uh, have the same uh, same rule and the astronauts okay so anyone actually uh, who actually go to the uh, harsh environment and risky fields in that that also includes like the um, um, like if you watch the James Bond movies so you will find like the James Bond always have the physical fitness test right you have to pass the fitness test before you actually go to a different mission so it's uh, very uh, similar to that like if you um, are uh, selected to go to uh, work in a harsh environment the first thing you the first step is to uh, do the physical uh, tests okay and apart from there you have to do a lot of uh, different other required trainings and these trainings would increase your due diligence at the work okay one of the important thing is the history is alive uh, especially in canada we do that uh, emergency first aid uh, training the lifeboat training uh, wims uh, tgd uh, work at heights or like the fall arrest training, the firefight training and the high angle rescue these trainings okay so H2 is alive is a training uh, to determine like a, like if there are any risk possessed for the hydrogen sulfide okay? we all know like hydrogen sulfide is uh, poisonous gas so uh, hydrogen sulfide also tells the body to start breathing so this is very very toxic and uh, cause nearly instantaneous death uh, by interfering with the nervous system of the body um, since uh, in oil and gas um, um, reservoirs could contain the hydrogen sulfide so this is uh, important to know to how to detect and if we actually can detect the hydrogen sulfide how we can, uh, if it's in the low concentration it can be odorless so that risk actually increase even more so how we can actually prevent that okay so sorry um, so these are the uh, required trainings actually we have for the h2 is alive it is the detection rescue technique uh, self-contained breathing apparatus or skiba uh, support air breathing apparatus gas protection so all of these are the part of the history is alive another record training is the whims it's uh, not only for the offshore platform to work also if you actually want to work in a lab you have to take the whims training especially for the engineers uh, or the technicians whims training is very important in your workplace if you work in a uh, chemistry uh, lab or any kind of analytical laboratories or any engineering workshop uh, the first thing your employer will do is to uh, give you a, a women's training uh, along with the uh, with the SDS uh, safety data sheet uh, training if you actually work with the chemicals so the suit uh, what types of suit actually we use in the uh, offshore training so uh, this is um, uh, one of the uh, suit currently used in uh, Newfoundland uh, offshore board uh, oil and gas sector is called the Survive Tech HPTSS or Helicopter Passenger Transport Safety Suit. So since uh, there was an uh, incident and lots of uh, uh, people have died after that, I mean it became more and more uh, safety oriented so that um, we actually uh, do not uh, lose any life so uh, what are the main features it preserves heat in cold water environment and it also provides buoyancy so there is another types of suit which is h-u-e-b-a uh, or uh, the helicopter um, underwater escape breathing apparatus or h-u-b-a is attached with this uh, suit okay uh, it includes that and also it includes the life vest uh, emergency locate uh, locator beacon so that uh, it can um, always uh, give the GPS uh, signal just like your mobile phone you got the GPS tracking the flash troop so that at any <clears throat> any eventful time if, uh, if uh, someone need to locate you 
uh, you can the visual identification through the flash can be done the whistle of course and the body line okay uh, so these are like the the components uh, for this uh, the survive tech groups helicopter passenger thing so uh, it's uh, better like I mean to go through the the charts like I mean what types of gears actually used in this uh, sort of apparatus for instance like the neoprene boots what we, why we need the neoprene boots it's got a good grip and also the eyes uh, it's a thermal resistance so th this is why it is important so these are the things we have now these suits are designed for survival okay not for comfort so this uh, most important thing we have to remember okay and as I said like new print boots and gloves these uh, keep extreme it is in warm condition and things and HUBA uh, another component of the of the of the suit it is actually an underwater uh, escape breathing apparatus if you are a fan of Sherlock Holmes probably you have seen the Sherlock when um, Sherlock actually went to confront with Dr. Moriarty in uh, Switzerland that um, place uh, near the waterfall he actually had this uh, uh, this uh, H-U-E-B-A okay so uh, to this uh, short, small under um, a small oxygen supply tank so um, it gives actually the um, uh, just like the just like the scuba drive di divers it gives like the same uh, uh, types of the oxygen flow uh, but the supply here is very limited um, like five minutes not more than five minutes it depends on the physical fitness ability to stay calm but I mean it uh, gives not more than five minutes to do that however there is another type of risk actually associated with that which is um, the use of this uh, uh, apparatus uh, due to the risk of air embolism so air embolism is a type of medical condition uh, which is like uh, infusing the air or the gas bubbles to our blood so it could cause um, a huge problem uh, because this uh, if, if we have the air bubbles or the uh, gas bubbles inside our blood it could actually go to run through our veins and uh, these air bubbles could hit to our uh, organs like kidneys or, or even um, it can actually uh, uh, drive our heart and create like a stroke like symptoms and possible cardiac arrest if it's actually reached to the heart okay so this is very very severe and dangerous actually so uh, there is a certain level of depth we need to consider like I mean if we uh, if we dive more than uh, 20 meter all of a sudden these types of uh, issues could arise when we actually uh, go up all of a sudden from that that depth so uh, that's exactly why the trainings are, are very Personal uh, locator beacon, each helicopter transport got the personal locator beacon, okay, uh, for the helicopters it's the bigger and for the personal uh, emergency locator it's the uh, smaller, uh, smaller uh, location. so this is the smaller types and for the uh, helicopters and like if it's attached with the ship it's the bigger one. Now the uh, regardless what type of uh, personal locator beacon the working principle is same uh, it actually goes to the satellites and from the satellites the signal actually comes to the rescue center and it gives uh, get the idea where the person is uh, located so uh, it works through the uh, GPS uh, satellite so the rescue center actually get the exact uh, GPS coordinator from the satellites that's right now in your mobile phone you have but it's more sophisticated and so 
uh, this is about like the locator beacon and it's the given an example like this how this uh, locator beacon actually works uh, required trainings, uh, especially in North America, uh, the BST or basic survival training is uh, mandatory. Uh, in case of European standards, they have a voice set, which is a basic offshore safety and action and uh, emergency training. And um, with that, uh, the helicopter and escape training, uh, basic firefight, uh, life raft to use and escape from hazardous environment all these are the components of of this uh, survival uh, training okay so these are the um, some examples uh, please watch it and you can actually see like the, how uh, how actually this uh, training actually works so um, life raft training and uh, helicopter underwater escape trainings okay so these trainings actually uh, give us the understanding like I mean if the helicopter actually uh, uh, falling down the water just exactly like uh, the happened with the here okay so then uh, it's if it land on the water so what could happen or how we can actually um, um, how we can actually uh, like uh, assemble the canopy, signal the rescuers, and then how we can actually um, uh, escape. Okay, so this is about like the uh, life draft training. But if the helicopter actually um, hit, and if if we have the fire, then we need to know like the uh, how to. Uh, do the firefighting and escape okay so we uh, need to know the use of fire extinguisher uh, or like the handle the hoses um, evacuation uh, plan so every vessel in Canada must have an evacuation procedure for the safe evacuation from the ship within remember the time 30 minutes after abandoned ship signal is given okay so within 30 minutes all the passengers must evacuate from the ship so the ship's evacuation plan should be designed in such a way okay station bill and uh, this is how the evacuation management actually works okay so every crew member is responsible for becoming familiar with the station bill installation so uh, the details rules and responsibilities of the personnel during the offshore emergency is given at the station bill okay so and also the layout of the starboard side and the port side everything okay and this is an example how the uh, the instructions of the uh, safety instructions and uh, the abandonment during the time of abandonment or the poisonous gas so what would be the steps and the procedures we should actually take you will find it in, in any ship in Canada, uh, the, the procedures actually uh, like that, okay? Now, um, escape plan, the great escape. <laughs> so, this following um, uh, slides will actually describe the escape plans, okay? How the best uh, escape actually works. So there are uh, several types of escape plans we have. One is the escape chute. Uh, we just use uh, gravity, not power. So this is a this is a good thing about that because if uh, if the for instance the offshore platform, okay. So if the offshore platform got fire at that time, all the signals and like the power lines could be destroyed. Okay, so uh, at that time, the, only the mechanical um, um, way to uh, mechanical power, uh, if we can actually use that, that would be the great. So that's why uh, escape chute is one of the um, one of the safest mode to escape. It requires no power. Uh, it potentially equipped with a life raft as means of escape. Okay. Um, the provide safe controlled uh, descent from the height 
donut uh, so this is a type or another types of escape like i mean uh, equipped with the rippling brake so please watch this video to get more idea about how this harness actually works in this uh, course and how how the donuts uh, can work but it need a uh, special uh, training actually Scramble net is another way to escape, but the problem would be the limited length uh, and uh, strenuous effort required to climb. It's uh, but the uh, good part is it's uh, simple and easy to deploy. Okay, David. David is uh, this kind of uh, life um, uh, life rafts <clears throat> uh, hanging with the with the main uh, mothership so a uh, small type of crane actually uh, actually uh, hang this uh, boat uh, from uh, from the ship so that uh, during the time of emergencies you can just uh, go and unplug these uh, cranes and you can actually go so the David is uh, is very very popular but there is some problems too uh, problem would be like uh, if there is a high waves or or if the ship actually is for instance going to sink very soon so using the David would be a problem because it will move very much okay uh, David launch life raft is much more safer than David because it got a canopy covered with canopy with emergency provision and first aid kit okay it the good part is it can be lowered by gravity uh, no power is required okay and the occupation size is also big it from 12 to 150 occupants which is which is really really big so there's a youtube video please watch this youtube video and and you can learn more about the it. so this is how the david actually uh, launched um sometimes actually the you can actually increase the numbers of the Directed crew also lifeboats uh, lifeboats can be full or partially enclosed uh, the it can be launched by the David or free fall okay it uh, lifeboat is mandatory and required for all vessels it's uh, located near the accommodation and optimally on the opposite sides of the vessel okay how the lifeboats can be launched Please uh, watch the video and you can see like how the lifeboat uh, can be launched in the free fall. Okay, so uh, the uh, to release or cutting of the restraining line. FRC first rescue craft. Now once you actually um, uh, start the escaping procedure and you escape, like the first thing. That the coast guards or will do is to start the uh, the operating the rescue craft. Okay, so it can be launched from special davits and um, um, it can be intended to for use in rescue or man overboard situation. Okay, so this is the uh, the uh, in of the. another <clears throat> uh, way to uh, the escape now these are the uh, ways we can actually um, the escapes and uh, we can actually combat to to any of the extremities okay so um, uh, now we know what are the uh, steps and procedures we can actually take when we are in the uh, when we are actually um, operating in the in the marine environment okay so uh, have a good day everyone and uh, we'll uh, continue with the next uh, class take care bye